Last time I blacked out was a little bit over a year ago. I got really angry, so I went to my room to go calm down, play music. And then, like, I don't know, like, I woke up in the ICU. I was blacked out for five days. My heart stopped in Maryville Hospital. I threatened to choke myself with a telephone cord in there. I, I guess I pulled, like, a, a big knife on, like, my aunt. She called me crazy and told me to take my crazy pills. And that's one thing I don't like. I don't like feeling crazy. It's a disorder I, I didn't ask for. I can't control it. It's always coming to me killing myself. Like, like I've been, like, really su suicidal or I'm, like, homicidal towards my family and that's not me I want to live I love life I love everything about it, everybody that's in it and like when I when I black out I'm a total opposite person and I just don't like it it's crazy it's not me I got diagnosed with bipolar. The part of it was panic depression. Um, it's when I can be like depressed for days on end. It's a lot. It means like a long period of time depression. Sometimes you can get suicidal. Sometimes like you're really high, like you're really happy, and then you're really low, down in the dumps for like ever. Then you just like goes back and forth. It's not a stable mood. Uh, I have anxiety problems to the point I can have random panic attacks. I cause a stutter when my anxiety gets up. Um, I get really anxious, which is part of my anxiety. I have OCD, which I have to like do certain things certain ways or else like I spaz out. I have a little bit of anger issues. There's not really, I can, it's not like diagnosed, but they say I have anger issues because of the past issues I've been through. The major mental illnesses, uh, they're caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. So, you know, there are multiple neurotransmitters in the brain and um, people who suffer from mental illness would have a relative deficiency of one or more of those neurotransmitters and that's what causes the symptoms of the illness. And then all of the medications that we use for the most part are designed to kind of help restore the balance of the neurotransmitter. Lithium makes me like up for days on end like I can't sleep and when I do it's for like 17 hours straight like I don't get up I'm just dead cold and when I'm on it like I'm not bubbly I'm not energetic or outgoing and that's usually how I am I feel like a zombie when I'm on them I feel like I can't focus pay attention I'm just not me because like I'm used to me being outgoing bubbly outspoken when I'm on it, I'm just like hey guys what's up but usually when I'm not on them, I see my friends, like I run, I jump on them, pick them up, swing them around, because that's just a goofy me. And on them, I'm just like, blah, like, I'm just like normal to everybody else. Like, I just blend in the crowd. There, there's really a lot of good evidence that shows that people who stay on a lot of psychiatric medications for the long period of time do worse than people who are able to use them over the short term. But we also know that there's not really any way to predict who's going to do well in medication. So our position really is that everybody should have adequate information and adequate support to make decisions for themselves about whether or not to continue to take medication. Like any pill generally takes about a week to be in your system to have its full effect on you. Well, while I was in the hospital, like I was there for a week and they said I was fine. But then I was like, no, you know, I'm not fine. I, I, telling you I'm not fine. I don't need to go home right now. I don't need to because I know if I do something bad is going to happen. Well, I ended up going home and I I like freaked out. It made me black out like first time I've ever blacked out and I don't remember anything. 
Like I, I was, my family told me I pulled a knife on them and tried to harm them and I just went crazy. I tried to kill myself by taking like a bunch of pills, like prescription pills, like anything and everything you can think of, like Vicodin, sleeping pills, Ambien, ibuprofen, just anything that I could get my hands on. Just cause like the medication made me literally like go crazy in my own head. I've thought of various ways to kill myself and I've only tried like one or two, but they don't seem to work out for me very often, obviously. So I just say, whatever is gonna happen, it's gonna happen. I hope I go peacefully. If not, with like a big bang. So I'm like remembered forever. The kind of cuts you're talking about are really twofold. It's not just budget cuts, it's also service reductions. So that about a year ago, last July, uh, our governor determined that people who were not Title 19 eligible, that is to say people for whom the services were not reimbursed from the federal government and were required to be paid for by state-only funding, with respect to those people with serious mental illness in the public mental health system, uh, our governor determined that they were no longer eligible for certain services, things such as case management, um, brand name medications, housing, the kind of community supports that are critical to assist people in uh, dealing with their brain disorders. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there have been significant budget cuts that have reduced the resources available to people who do have those service arrays available to them. So it's been a, a double whammy. It's been a, a two-fold hit. Reduction in services and significant budget reductions for those services that are available. Budget cuts happen. What tends to be preserved is medication in hospitals. And those are not benefits that help people get a life back. So I, I think unless we can convince people that, unless we can demonstrate that there actually are less expensive services that are very effective that help people stay in the community and get better then it's going to continue to get bad and we're actually partnering with the school of social work to do some of that evaluation now why should i have to pay to receive counseling when i actually do need it like you're gonna make it harder on me to go throughout my life to make it harder on me and my already issues i have like you're, you're just going to add on to it so i have to pay for my own medication I do need in the long run like that's just craziness like you're screwing people in general like you're screwing them over like why why sit there and make a depressed person more depressed because they have to pay for their pills to make them not depressed like that's craziness why like there's no point to it I think we were all kind of experiencing some denial initially that this, this didn't seem fair and it didn't make sense. But I was actually quite proud of the way that the community rallied together and, and uh, became quite creative in establishing some other ways to support each other. We had consumers and, and peer-run organizations that opened their doors to try to, to support those in need. We um, established, um, instead of, or in addition to, I should say, crisis response lines, we've also established what are called warm lines, which are staffed by peers in the system who are basically able to provide uh, someone else to talk with. Uh, so we've got warm lines, we've had peer supports, we've had advocates and, and uh, community members coming together to look at creative options. It's made it more difficult for us to recruit because we, are, we can no longer say that all of the patients that are served are gonna get the you know, deluxe package of services that we had before. Um, there were some ethical considerations at the time of the non-Title 19 transition. I mean, the problem was we had, you know, most of our patients are chronically, severely mentally ill and they had been receiving services for years. 
they may have been on a combination of meds that were effective for a very long time, sometimes years. And then we had to take them off of that medication. And it's difficult for a psychiatrist to discontinue a medication when that medication was the one and only drug that has ever helped. And so there was an ethical concern with the psychiatrist. How could we do that? How could we stop a medication that is the one medication that was effective? My understanding is that there were people who knew that young man had some difficulty before this happened. And um, you can, in the state of Arizona, you can have a person petitioned for a court-ordered evaluation. And you know, I wasn't there, I can't really say kind of what happened there, but um, if a person is exhibiting significant symptoms of a mental illness where there is concern that they could be unsafe, you can you know, petition for an evaluation in this state and get the person to treatment even if they don't want to pursue treatment. Um, I don't know if that would have prevented what happened there, but at least it would have uh, given people the opportunity to intervene and work with him to see if there was something that could have been done. I think what happens in the wake of a tragedy such as the shootings in Tucson is that everybody says we need more money for mental health. Well. If we say we need more money for mental health, again, it goes to medication and hospitals. And there are choices about what kinds of opportunities we can offer to people. One of the challenges with people who tend to be um, growingly increasingly paranoid or isolated or distant from their family is that the services we currently offer are not attractive and they tend to drive people away because they focus on locking people up and forcibly medicating them. Um, there's a program in development um, by the National Coalition for Mental Health Recovery that's called Emotional CPR. And it's a public health awareness program that teaches people to see somebody in emotional crisis, to reach out to make a connection with them, to help them sort of figure out what's going on in their life, and to decide what kind of resources they might need, whether those are behavioral health resources or family resources or faith-based resources, but they don't focus on locking people up. They focus on, uh, on creating stronger communities. The Tucson tragedy has been a double-edged sword in that it has served a positive purpose of, a raising, of raising awareness of folks with brain disorders and mental health systems throughout our state. But at the same time, the other side of that issue is that it has enhanced the stigmatizing thinking that suggests that people with mental illness are dangerous. That's not true. Treatment works. Jared Loeffner was never exposed, I believe, to our treatment system. Uh, what might have happened differently in that case might have derailed this tragedy and gotten this young man into a treatment system that could have uh, assisted him and his family in getting through this tragedy. And I, I just believe that like people that think people that are, have like anxiety or bipolar, that they're just going to freak out and try to harm others. A lot of people aren't like that. A lot of people are more suicidal, I believe, because they have to deal with their own disorder. And they're like, well, why should I be here? People already think I'm crazy. That's the whole point of being here and, and getting tortured every day. Or having people just stare at you, you know, and just be like, oh, she's crazy, you know, like don't talk to her. Like, that's just stupid. I, I will admit that I do get angry, and that's awesome that, like, they actually see me for me. Because, yes, I do get angry, you know, like, I, I do have flaws. I'm glad that, like, they, I'm glad that my friends can actually accept me with my flaws and my good, because I, I, I am a giver, I'm not a taker. I help out everybody I can. I'm such a big heart, I have a good bubbly personality, I'm a positive person. I'm glad that everybody can see me for me and also my flaws included and that they can still accept me for me. That's awesome. Her friends are the number one thing keeping her up right now. She hangs around us because we're all kind of like her, you know, like we all have our own issues and we all just, just want to enjoy ourselves with friends. And if it wasn't for her having like the friends she does have, because she has so many different types of groups of friends, like skaters to gangsters to like emos, all that, you know? But like, She's just one of those type of people. We all have like a different personality, but we all come from like the same background, like the same past. Like Katie and me, like her, where she's living now with her mom and her stepdad, it's crazy because 
they look a lot like my mom and my mom's boyfriend that tries to be my stepdad. So me and her understand each other, we get along. We have like, we look somewhat alike, like, cause we're both bigger girls and like, that's like our issues, you know? Cause a lot of people are like, oh, you know, like the fat. And we're like, no, f you, you know? And then me and Danny, you know, like, we just click so well, like from like day one, like we have like the same personality, same thoughts, same views, as like pretty much almost everything. Me and Lucy, we've just been so long, been friends for so long, it's just like, you just can't cut the ties, you know? Like we, like I've seen him go from being immature and being little to being grown and being responsible. And like that's good because like I kind of motivate him to be responsible because I'm a little bit more responsible than he is, a little bit more mature. So like, we, like, like all of us together pretty much just keep each other together. Like we're like one unit. We're like a pack of lions, you know, like we all have like, our different roles and we all fit together so well. And I'm bipolar myself with ADHD, all that. Bipolar, I do have bipolar. ADHD, bipolar, ADD. We, we should all support each other, make, it, make each other happy. Like, all five of us together, like we all have different personalities, but we all have that bubble, we all have a bubbly personality in our own way. And just her being around that, it keeps her from getting angry. It keeps her from being mad all the time. Just if we're all just laughing and having a good time, she's having a good time. But if we're all sitting there arguing, then she's not having a good day. And then that makes her angry. She gets mad really easy. But it's not that so much that it's mad, it's just that her emotions inside. She tries to mask them so when things come her way, it's like a light switch, she goes off all fast. And like her meds and everything like that, like all her mental illness, like just plays a, a big role in her life. Honestly, I see her like helping her friends a lot more than she doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't like taking help. She, she's always told me she's a giver and like I always try to give her stuff, but she gets mad and she won't take it. So, I mean, I always see her going out, out of her way to help people. I've never really seen her accept too much help. She just does everything she can for us. Like, she takes care of us. And she just, I don't know. <laughs> she just makes me happy. If she's not around friends, then she's usually like depressed, stuff like that. But when she's around everyone, like she's just the most happiest person you can meet. We do everything together. If I need her, she's there for me, even if she's having a bad day. She's there for me. If, if I need a shoulder to cry on, she comes to see me. If, it, all around, just if I need her, she's always there. Whether she's having a bad day, good day, whether she's on top of the world, whether she's high, sober, she's always there for me. Sometimes her meds aren't what she likes, she tells me. Like, she wants something that will keep her normal, but the doctors sometimes don't want to hear it. They just keep trying it, keep trying it and then see me in two months or 60 days, whatever. And if it doesn't work, then then I'll get you something new. I didn't like the way it made me feel, so I started smoking marijuana, and it actually helps me sleep, it helps me eat, keeps me more of a calm, mellow state, but I'm still my goofy, outgoing person. Like, when I don't smoke, like, I tend to be more edgy. I'm like, I'm like walking on eggshells all the time. Like, some person you just say, like, the Lord's word would be like, and, and I'll be like, ah, you know, it'll spaz out. And it keeps me more on a calm level, and like my actual anxiety level is not high. It just keeps me like mellow, like it keeps me awake but tired, you know, because I'm so relaxed, but I'm so hyper at the same time. Like, I just don't care about anybody, you know, talking or, you know, causing a problem, because I'm a positive person. If you ain't got nothing positive to say, deuces, keep walking, I don't care, you know. That, that, that's where it ultimately keeps me, like keeps me from being depressed and freaking out and being angry about something so stupid. Folks with serious mental illness often don't want to take the medications at the dosages prescribed because it's, it, it doesn't make them feel good, it makes them feel bad. Uh, it has significant negative side effects. Uh, with respect to medical marijuana, I believe, as in any medications, certain drugs work for certain people. If a medication or a drug makes someone feel better, I think there's value to it. I recognize that some people feel better in smoking marijuana. What I understand, and I don't have any scientific data to support this, but that people with serious mental illness often use marijuana as a supplement to a smaller dosage of psychotropic medications. People who are experienced in their illness and understand how to modulate the highs and lows of a brain disorder often are able to use marijuana to 
supplement, again, a, a reduced dosage of psychotropic medications. So I think there's value to it, just as I think there's value to any drug that can make a person uh, feel better. And like, I don't smoke marijuana just to get high. Like, I take a couple hits and I'm good, I'm calm. Because like, I, I don't need that high effect. That's not, not what I'm using it for. I'm using it to keep me from like having panic attacks, freaking out, spazzing out, getting angry, getting really depressed. Because that's pretty much my whole day. Like, I get depressed sometimes and get angry, have panic attacks. In general, I smoke maybe a couple hits a day. And it's generally in the morning before school, and then I'm good throughout the whole day. If I had complete control, I'd reestablish the funding so that we could continue to provide the services that we had. What I would do would be to get rid of the regional behavioral health systems and embrace the notion that it's the state's job to provide health care to people who live here. And I would suggest that the Department of Health Services needs to be in the business of providing health care directly. Let's get rid of the REBAs, the Regional Behavioral Health Authorities, and have case managers working directly for the state, such as what exists in the system for persons with, seri with, with developmental disabilities. I don't, I don't think we need those extra layers, and certainly the notion of having a public for-profit company in a public health system creates a tension that can't be resolved. Those motivations are different. A public health system has a motivation to provide service to people who live in our community. A for-profit publicly held company is responsible to its shareholders. And so those two different motivations, again, create a tension that results in people not being served in our community. I've actually written the state a couple of proposals about this. For one thing, I think I would expand peer-run services. There are some rules based in um, the Arnold lawsuit, and there's a, a standing consent decree that right now is not being monitored, it's the Arnold lawsuit, um, that in the past has set some guidelines for case management and certain services like that. And um, Arnold was a, a wonderful benefit for people in the state of Arizona because it, it's what created our community-based behavioral health system that we didn't have before. But I think it's time for us to look at how we can modify that in a way that is less clinical, less focused on medication, and more focused on skill building and actually helping people get back into the community. I think it's very likely it could get worse before it gets better. You know, as the budget shortfall continues and if, as they have to continue to cut services, I think we will see more cuts in this system. Um, I hate to say it, but I think um, what will ultimately happen is they will begin to recognize that we are providing uncompensated care in hospitals, which will financially harm the hospitals. I think they will also recognize that we are now uh, treating a significant number of mentally ill people in the jails or prison, which is not where they belong. But that typically is what happened. If, you know, if you don't provide the services somewhere, they're going to have to be provided somewhere else. Um, so I think things will probably get worse before they get better. Unfortunately, there might be another bad event and that will draw attention to it and might you know, kind of force the funding stream again. But, you know, who knows? We are using the fiscal crisis as cover to reduce the services to people with human service needs. Um, I believe that the publicly the public mental health system should be immune from fiscal issues. It should have nothing to do with the nature or state of our economy. Yet, what's happened now because of the fiscal crisis is that services have been dramatically reduced. It's not okay. That doesn't serve the people well. I would suggest that's a short-sighted view and our state will be paying for that for a long time. You know what, this is my life you won't understand until you actually live a day in my life. Like, I really wish someone could actually like try to comprehend how it is to be me. Because like, I'm just like everybody else, like a lot of people, even my own principal didn't know I suffered from depression and anxiety. Like he didn't know until I just informed him a couple weeks ago. Like, he had no clue because you can't really tell. Like, it could be anywhere, it could be in anybody. You just don't know until someone actually comes out and be honest with you and tell you like, hey, I do have a 
mental health il illness. This is what it is. This is how it affects my life. You know, and people like label me as crazy just because I get angry. Well, who doesn't get angry? Who doesn't deal with depression? Who doesn't, you know, have highs and lows and have anxiety problems? Like mine is just more severe than normal people. I just have more of a daily struggle than everybody else does. And I think in the long run, I think it might just make me stronger. So I do deal with a lot of stuff at home in school alone, like in my life. There's a lot of stuff going on and I think I deal with it pretty good. Especially for being depressed all the time and having anger issues. Like, it, be, it all the struggles helps me for like the long run. Because now I struggle and then later on in life I might be able to learn to deal with it and might maybe not be, maybe not have to struggle in the future. Like now it could be like a prep class, you know, it's for me for, for the future life. Thank you.